Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, for those of you joining us particularly for this session, welcome to the Kyoto Prize at Oxford. My name is Callum Miller. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Associate Dean here at the Blavatnik School of Government. It's our great pleasure to welcome those joining us here in Oxford, but also those joining us online. So whether you are at the Australian National University in Canberra, at the Lagos Business School, or at Tsinghua University in China, you're most welcome, and I hope you're going to enjoy the next hour and a half of discussion. It's my great pleasure and honour to introduce uh, the laureate uh, for the Kyoto Prize in Advanced Technology from 2017, Dr. Takashi Mamura. Uh, Dr. Mamura was recognised as the inventor of the High Electron Mobility Transistor, or HEMPT, about which I know he will say a few words in his presentation shortly. Dr. Mamura joined Fujitsu from Osaka University in 1970 and worked in those research laboratories for 47 years. It was there that he invented HEMPT and also where he made a number of other discoveries. He is currently an honorary fellow of the Fujitsu Labs and an executive visiting researcher at the Advanced ICT Research Institute, Japan's National Institute of Information Communications Technology. Dr. Mamura, it's a great honor and pleasure for us to have you with us. We look forward very much to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mira. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. It, is, it truly is a great pleasure and honor for me to receive the 2017 Kyoto Prize for my research on semiconductor devices. It has been nearly 40 years since I developed the high electron mobility transistor called HEMT, for which I have been awarded this prestigious prize. Over the year, HEMS has have found a broad range of applications as one of the fundamental technologies advancing innovation in information and communication systems. As you can see from this slide, the current mirror main Application for HEMT is in wireless systems, including satellite broadcast receivers, mobile phone systems, automotive millimeter wave radars, GPS navigation systems, and broadband wireless access systems. In this lecture, I will first show you an animation that will give you a brief introduction to the concept of HEMS. Then I will talk about my series of research and development efforts at Fujitsu Laboratory Limited, covering everything from the invention of HEMS to the development of technology for their early practical applications. First, let's watch the animation. Animation, please. Some 40 years ago, was playing a key role in today's information and communication technology. Electrons move at high speed in a semiconductor. This innovative transistor is a hand. The device was invented in 1979 by Fujitsu, who also succeeded in verifying its superb performance for the first time in the world. Stands for High Electron Mobility Transistor. It was announced to the world in 1980. In order to create a new transistor, it was necessary to create a new path for electrons. A path for them to move smoothly at high speeds in the transistor. It's like an exclusive lane for electrons. In the past, the fastest transistor was a gallium arsenide transistor. However, the speed of electrons slowed down in the path as they are disturbed by a lot of donor impurities. In the hand, we were able to accelerate the electron mobility by creating an exclusive lane with almost no impurities. As a result, electron mobility was significantly improved compared with ordinary transistors. Let's take a look at how HEMTS work through some diagrams. Electrons move from source to drain, passing under the gate on the way. The speed of a transistor is determined by how quickly the electrons travel under the gate. However, 
In past transistors, electrons bumped into donor impurities along the way, and their speed slowed down. In the hemp, a layer of gallium arsenide that has almost no impurities is generated. And on top of it, a layer of aluminum gallium arsenide that includes donor impurities is grown. In this structure, electrons leave the aluminum gallium arsenide layer and collect in the impurity-free gallium arsenide layer below. This creates a layer of two-dimensional electron gas. When voltage is applied to it, electrons move in path at high speed without bumping into impurities. Next, let's take a look at how hands work by discussing energy bands. Every semiconductor material has its own energy band structure. When a layer of aluminum gallium arsenide and a layer of gallium arsenide are connected, the electrons move to the gallium arsenide layer as it pulls electrons stronger than the aluminum gallium arsenide. This creates an exclusive lane for the electrons. This lane, or two-dimensional electron gas, allows hemp to operate at high speed with very little energy loss. However, producing this two-dimensional electron gas requires high-precision crystal growth technology. One such technology is molecular beam epitaxy. For example, the thickness of the crystal layer of aluminum gallium arsenide that serves as the hemp's electron supply layer is only 30 nanometers. A molecular beam epitaxial system controls the thickness of this layer to be equal and prevents the material from mixing with the materials in layers above and below. Today, there is a new semiconductor material, gallium nitride, that allows hence to operate with 10 times the number of electrons and voltage of gallium arsenide transistors. From parabolic antennas to car navigation systems, radar detectors, and mobile phone base station systems, hands are incorporated in a range of devices that are needed for information and communication systems. They are also key components of radio telescopes searching for new interstellar molecules, making HEMTS crucial to scientific advancement. HEMTS are expected to continue playing an important role in our society. Shaping tomorrow with you. My first in encounter with transistors date back to about half a century ago, partly upon the recommendation of Professor Senjiro Narita, my advisor at Osaka University, I joined Fujitsu Limited in Kobe in 1970. Before I joined Fujitsu, I was told that I would be assigned to a section that worked on the optical properties of semiconductors. But in reality, I ended up being assigned to a section that de developed transistors. As far as I can remember, immediately after I assumed my position, a general manager of that section gave me an explanation on transistors. I can remember his work like they were yesterday. Simply put, transistors are made by sticking two PN junctions together back to back. Unfortunately, I had no idea what a, a PN junction even was. And so I didn't understand how transistors operated. When I reported this to a senior researcher in my group, he handed me a paper on PN junctions by William Shockley, who invented PN junction transistor in 1948, saying that I should read that, that, that paper first. I was struck with admiration of how PN junction rectification properties were described in elegant simplicity. After that, the section I had originally been assigned to asked for my reassignment. 
but I had already become so entranced by PM junctions that I wanted to continue my work in the device field, and they finally allowed me to have my way. Soon an orientation for new hires began, and under the instruction of my senior researchers, I was able to put a transistor into operation as my first semiconductor device. Its static current voltage characteristics, as measured by the CAP tracer, were exactly what I saw in the textbook on transistors. I marveled at the high technological level of semiconductor device production while simultaneously experiencing the great joy of creating something. About a year or two after I joined the company, I was seized by the urge to create a new device on my own. I'll admit that I was young and self-conceited at the time, and for several years after that, the various devices that I proposed proved to be nothing but one useless device after another. The best I could hope for was to have one of my papers published in the Journal of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers in the United States, but my interests in in semiconductor devices only few grow few stronger. Behind it, I remember that senior researchers of the technical group in Kobe had a culture of encouraging their junior researchers to take on challenges in new directions. In 1975, I was transferred to Fujitsu Laboratory Limited in Kawasaki City Kanagawa Prefecture and become involved in the development of, of high-speed compound semiconductor electronic devices instead of the silicon semiconductor devices that I had worked on before. Historically speaking, the development of a high-speed transistor was one of the key technological challenges involving semiconductor devices after the invention of PN junction transistor by Bell Laboratory in the United States in 1948. This was because higher speed transistors were expected to improve the performance of various information and communication systems by processing huge amount of data in a short time and sending and receiving high-frequency radio signals. Now allow me to walk through you through the basic mechanism that governs the speed of transistors. There are many different types of transistors, but let's look at the field effect transistors called FETs, which are the most popular. FETs operate as drain current changes in proportion to the total number of electrons directly under the gate electrode that is increased or decreased according to the level of a signal voltage applied to the gate electrode. The time required for the total number of electrons to increase or decrease approximate the time required for electrons to run through the current path directly under the gate electrode. This is time known as the electron transit time. If the electron transit time can be decreased, it becomes possible to keep pace with input signals that alter in short time frames, thus increasing the speed of transistor. 
Such being the case, there are two ways to develop high-speed transistor. One is to make the great electrode shorter. That is to miniaturize it. This is the traditional approach for semiconductor devices and can be observed in the way that the silicon integrated circuits have become increasingly miniaturized with each new generation. The other approach for increasing the transistor's speed is to increasing the velocity of electrons. Now, how can we make this happen? Here we can use the Ohm's law, which states that the amount of current is proportional to the level of voltage applied. The amount of current increases due to increase in electrons' velocity as well as the level of voltage. Now mobility refers to the ease increasing the speed and to increasing the speed of transistors. One simply has to increase the, the electron's mobility as much as possible. Different semiconductor materials differ in their electron mobility characteristics because the compound semiconductor galimacinide has about five times as much as electron mobility as silicon. The galimacinide metal semiconductor, FET, called MESFET, drew much attention as a material for high-speed transistors in the microwave band from the early 1970s, and a great deal of effort was put into research and development. Back in 1979, when I first invented HEMS, I was part of a team working on development of galimacinide MESFETs. Uh, that was invented by Carver Mead in 1966. It had long been assumed by device researchers that Garmin-Arsenal MESFETs were the ultimate high-speed device, and all that could be done in the future would be to modify them. From there, my team began research into gallium arsenide, metal, semi metal oxide semiconductor FET called MOSFETs, which were completely different from MESFETs. As you may know, MOSFETs are an indispensable device for large-scale integrated circuit and our research object was to explore the possibility of creating galimacinide MOSFETs that were even faster than silicon MOSFET. Silicon MOSFETs operate by using a gate electrode positioned over the gate oxide film to induce electron across the silicon surface. However, at the time, no researcher had succeeded in creating a galimacinide MOSFET that would operate by inducing electron along the galimacinide surface like a silicon MOSFET. We were truly going where no one had gone before. We created gate oxide film in various, various ways and repeated our experiments, but could not induce electrons on the galimacinide surface no matter how hard we tried. With this, with silicon, electrons could be induced with ease by simply creating silicon dioxide film, films on the surface. But this wasn't the case with galimacinide arsenide. Presumably, this was due to the surface state formed near the, the interface between the galimacinide and the gate oxide film, or crystal imperfections that captures electrons. But all of our efforts to eliminate the surface states were in vain. In 1978, 
About one year after we first embarked upon this research, I had become increasingly convinced that I was running out of ideas that could possibly advance the research any further. I gave up on the idea of accumulating electrons and felt that I had reached an impasse. It was that time that I changed my goal and began assessing the switching in performance of MOSFET with the current pass that had been, upper, been doped with donor capability, cap capable of operating new with a relatively high service states. Since there was no longer any chance of developing MOSFETs with an electron accumulation layer, as we had in the intended. I wanted to show how far the de development team had become before closing the curtain of Garimasu and MOSFET research for good. We chose the 37th Device Research Conference, or DRC, in 1979 as the occasion to do this. Held in the United States, where transistors and semiconductor lasers were first introduced. DLC was the longest running annual conference on device research. While I was writing the paper for DLC, I stumbled upon an article of modulation dopt super lattices. which had been penned by researchers in a technological field, field different from my own. This was around February 1979. Now, modulation of the super lattice feature, a structure in which two different types of very thin semiconductor layers, highly pure Garimasana layer and M-type Aluminum gallium arsenide layer doped uh, with silicon are uh, stacked alternatively, alternatively in several dozen layers. The main focus of the article was on electron mobility within a super lattice. But what impressed me so profoundly was an experimental fact that was not even mentioned by the authors of that paper. In their experiments, electrons accumulated in the galimacinide layer sandwiched between two N-type aluminum galimacinide layers. I believe that this was something simply taken for granted in the technological field of super lattices at that time, but it gave me a fresh jolt and left a strong impression on me since I was directly engaged in a desperate struggle with Kalimasana's surface state. This is because, as I mentioned earlier, no electrons accumulate in Kalimasana MOSFETs due to their surface state. Since Kalimasana and aluminum Kalimasana in the modulation doped super lattice showed similar characteristics, in the crystal structure and the surface states of those crystal interfaces where raw electrons could be accumulated. Impressive as the experimental fact of electron accumulation was, it occurred in a highly special structure of modulation doppel super lattices, and so I was I wasn't able to gain any concrete ideas or inspiration at that time. I think I maintained a, a vague interest in this subject that lasted for some time, but it was so salt, so subtle, that it barely came to my conscious mind during the course of my daily activities. However, it seems that the human mind can change very suddenly. 
while I was chattering with a researcher at the 37th DRC immediately after I had presented my paper on Garimasana and MOSFETs, the idea pop popped into my mind that I could somehow make a practical device out of modulation of the super radices. This was at the reception of DRC on July 25, 1979. It came to me totally out of blue, out of the blue. And so mom the moment is still vivid in my memory. It was this event that gave me the willpower to focus my thoughts on coming up with ideas for a new device. To sum up the casual incident, an encounter with an article from the technological field, different from my own, and some small talk with a fellow researcher, triggered the invention of HAMS. In re retrospect, the bitter experiences, experiences of failure in Garimasana and MOSFET research made the greatest contributions to the invention of hands. You, can, you could say that my sense had, had been sh shaped by those failures, and it is probably those senses that helped me to discover something new in daily consciousness. Uh, the great microbiologist Louis Pasteur once said, chance favors only the prepared mind. In the case of Hamilton, I believe that it was those failure with Garimarasana and MOSFETs that cultivated my prepared mind. After returning home from the 37th DLC, I concentrated my thought on super lattice structure, despatry, seeking out, creating ideas until I was able to reach one simple conclusion. It was a kind of guiding principle that when working on ideas for practical device like a transistor, the simple structure is always the best. In accordance with this principle, it was clear that the simplest structure would be one in which the current, current channel is a single electron accumulation layer made from the combination of a high purity Galimasana layer and an anti-aluminum Galimasana layer. The next thing that needed to be clarified was how to control electrons within modulation Doppler super lattices. It was in July 1979, a few weeks after I had started thinking about this, that I happened upon the idea of hands. This, oh, I skipped. This hand-drawn energy band diagram explaining HEMS operating principle is an excerpt from a patent application submitted to the Internal Patent Department in August 1979. It illustrates the principle of how the HEMS layer structure and the electron accumulation layer should be controlled to operate the transistor, but its drawbacks can be found in its rather abstract expressions. Let me show you more specifically the roots of hemp device structure, which believes re that it was born out of a fusion of existing device structures. The key point behind this idea involved using a basic unit of modulation dot superlattices. That is a, the single heterojunction 
interface between an n-type aluminum galimacinide and galimacinide as a current churn and allowing the electric field effect to reach the, the electron accumulation layer within the galimacinide layer by eliminating electrons within the n-type aluminum galimacinide layer through through the introduction of metal semiconductor contact that would create a depression layer of the n-type aluminum galimacinide layer surface. If we use that the n-type aluminum galimacinide layer without electrons is a gate insulator, we could say that the device concept of the hemp is structurally similar to that of a MOSFET and metal semiconductor contact, which are used to deplete the n-type aluminum galimacinide layer, functions exactly the same as the gate electrode of a galimacinide MOSFET. It is therefore safe to say that the concept of existing devices such as galimacinide MESFET and galimacinide MOSFETs and the structure of existing, existing layers of modulation of super lattices were used to create the new device concept of end. To use the analogy of jigsaw puzzle, the three different pieces of galimacinide MESFETs, galimacinide MOSFETs, and modulation double super lattices were essential to complete the galimacinide, you know, uh, complete the Hems puzzle. I believe that this is true of research and development in, my, in any field, but one of the most effective methodologies for creating a new idea to, is to expand the scope of one's research. The process of inventing hams is a testament to this. Now what I, I wish to emphasize here is that it was extremely instructive that Galimacinae MOSFET, in which I experienced failure, were also an integral part of the formation of the HEM device concept. Through research and re development of HEMS, I believe that I was able to learn the important lesson that even experience of failure can be useful. I compiled my ideas on HEMS into a patent application, which was duly received by Fujitsu Patent Department in August 1979. However, the mere device of such a thing was nothing more than, than a castle in the air. Any idea must be demonstrated by experiments. To demonstrate the Hemet idea, all sorts of technique are required. An advanced crystal glass technique was necessary to prepare a hemmed prototype. I was working on the R&D of devices at that time, but I didn't have a technique for growing crystals with an accuracy for hemmed. The electron accumulation layer, which serves as the hemmed current channel, can exist in an extremely narrow region that is only as wide as the spread of an electron wave function from the heterojunction interface between the galimacinide and aluminum galimacinide layers, or seven dozen other layers. This meant that we needed a crystal growth technique for producing the heterojunction with a degree of accuracy on the order of atom layers. At that time, the only crystal growth technique, technology capable of meeting such stringent accuracy requirement was molecular beam taxi.
<clears throat> Technically, MV was a vacuum evaporation method for semiconductors, elements that form crystals are placed in each cell and heated. Each cell has a mechanical shutter, and when it opens, elements are radiated to crystal substrate like a beam. MVE coated to the spotlight as a technique for growing fine structures in 1973 when a research group <coughs> from IVM created the prototype for a super artist. This is a periodic structure in which about 100 very thin galimacinary layers and aluminum galimacinary layers are alternately stacked. MVE most distinctive feature is that it is capable of continuously growing semiconductors of different types by op opening closing a mechanical shutter. In Japan, many companies, university, and national research institutions began working in earnest on MVE between 1973 and 1975. Fortunately, there was one research group at Fujitsu Laboratory that used MVE to grow galimacinide and aluminum <coughs> galimacinide as Awesome. The group was led by researcher Satoshi Yami, now professor emeritus at Osaka University, when I explained my idea to that MB group, they agreed to offer their full support for the fabrication of heterojunction crystal. From that day, we formed a cross organizational small-scale prototype research group to commence joint research. Of course, this research began as an unauthorized project without letting our laboratory know about it. And so each researcher had only limited amount of time to allocate to it. In late December of 1979, after a few failures, we were able to develop a hemp chip that would function in very low yield wafers. This was about four months after the unauthorized hemp prototype research group had been formed to determine reproducibility. We performed another prototype study and used the experimental data gained thus far for our first paper on HEMS. When we finally confirmed that the birth of HEMS, I certainly did feel a great sense of achievement and pleasure, but I also remember feeling a sense of relief, most of all, as I would be able to give back to all the members of the MVE group who have so kindly cooperated with me. Having been brought into existence as a result of research seeking a high-speed device, hemps were basically a product of chance. Naturally, there was no demand for hemp in the market at the time of their birth. In fact, hemp came into commercial market seemingly out of nowhere. At the International Solid State Circuit Conference of 1983, we presented a paper, Low Noise Four Stage Amplifier for Possible Application in the microwave band for satellite communications, and the product of, drew the attention of those working at the radio observatory in the United States who were present at the conference. Thanks to Hem's superior noise characteristics at raw temperature, we announced during the 
confines of amplifier could potentially replace conventional parametric amplifiers or Garimasnoi MESFET amplifiers. We therefore decided on low noise amplifier for radio telescopes as the target for HEMT's fast protection application. The HEMT amplifier that was installed at the Nobuyama Radio Observatory in Nagano Prefecture in 1985 helped to discover unknown hydrocarbon molecules in dark nebulae, and it was later installed in the World Measure Radio Observatories. The discovery of this market, which was not yet valued and its performance at raw temperature, helped us to take an extremely important step, step toward innovation during the early days of development. The, Im the Im emergence of the market encouraged cooperate activity, cooperate activity which then ensured constant improvement of the device technology, thus opening up the way toward new application areas. It was around 90 87, that the adoption of HEMS began in full swing, replacing conventional Galimasin and MESFETs, they started to be used in large quantity for all noise amplifiers in satellite broadcast <coughs> receivers. Use of a low noise HEMS made it possible to reduce the size of parabolic antenna by more than half, which are as you might recall, trigger the explosive spread of satellite broadcasting in Japan and Europe, thereby eliminating the border of borders of information. Behind this rapid ad ad adoption were the achievement of higher quality and throughput of crystal growth methods and numerous technological breakthroughs that were unique to HEMS and necessary for their mass production. Nearly a half century has passed since I first encountered transistors. As I look back again, I can see my career as a researcher has been shaped by chance. An expected change of assigning the position set back in my research encounter with technological information from other field that uh, and talking with a researcher at the international conference. It is not hyperbole to say that I owe what I am today to this fateful event by encountering new things and unexpected events, I was amazed and inspired, which in turn motivated me to patiently continue taking on new challenges. This is how I, just an ordinary engineer, was able to create something that had not existed before, keeping these things firmly in my mind, I will continue to give my best effort going forward. In conclusion, in concluding, I would like to express my most heartfelt appreciation to the many people who have given me their guidance and support up to this day. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mamura, for that wonderful talk. Um, if you'll forgive me a moment of housekeeping, um, 
as we move into the question and answer session, uh, Dr. Mamura will be answering in Japanese. So those of you sitting here, uh, if you'd like to take your headsets, ensure that the earphone is plugged in, otherwise the device will not work, and uh, then select the channel on the right hand of the device, one for English, two for Japanese, and then control with volume on the left. If it's not working, that's because you haven't pressed the on-off switch, which is cunningly situated on the front of the device. Hope everyone's got that. For those of you joining us uh, from our three partner uh, organizations in Lagos, in Tsinghua, in China, uh, and uh, in Australia, if you're still up, uh, you can tune to these uh, language channels from the Kyoto uh, Prize website. So you should be able to have uh, the preceding question and answer session in either English or Japanese as you prefer. Let me introduce the uh, other person who's joined us here on the, on the panel today. Um, Dr. Gassan uh, Yassin is the Professor of Astrophysics here at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of the Queen's College. He uh, is the leader of a lab which develops superconducting detectors with quantum-linked uh, sensitivity and so relate very much to where we ended there uh, with Dr. Mamura talking about the application of HEMPT uh, to the field of astrophysics and as uh, astronomical research. So I uh, look forward to engaging both gentlemen in conversation in just a moment. Now over to you. Who has a question to start us off in this discussion? In that case, let me take one from uh, one of our colleagues. I'm afraid I don't know where um, Kirsty is uh, watching from, but Kirsty Schwartz has asked the question, Hemp's are very widely used now. Has any of their use surprised you? And what is next for Hemp? The biggest surprise to me was that uh, when it was first used for the astronomy, that was really a surprise for me because I had never expected uh, that type of application. ISSGGP was uh, academic uh, world, and then I was asked, uh, "Can you please sell this to me?" The, the someone from the United States asked me. I was really surprised, but at the same time, uh, by increasing the performance level of the device, uh, I thought I can increase the usage of hemp. Thank you so much. Professor Yasin, perhaps you'd like to say a word for those of us who are not as familiar with its application sure. in your field. Sure. Um, the um, application of hemp is extremely important. Uh, most telescopes that you hear about, such as uh, ALMA, which is um, a huge telescope uh, uh, built in, in the Andes, 64 dishes. Those telescopes try to detect signals uh, from galaxies um, and, and stars at frequencies which are quite high, about terahertz uh, frequencies. For that, uh, uh, those nice images that you normally see on TV are processed by the signal coming from the dish and ends up uh, in an astronomical receiver on a micron square device. And um, after that, the signal is then converted in frequencies from, say, one terahertz into, say, microwave frequencies at 10 gigahertz. And then a very crucial stage is amplifying the signal, it's still at um, cryogenic temperature, it's, it's not warm temperature like the satellite, because in astronomy we require extremely high sensitivity. We, we, we require ultimate sensitivity actually, which we call quantum limited sensitivity. And those hemp amplifiers uh, work extremely well. In fact, without those amplifiers, the sensitivity of the, receiver, of the receiver will not be able to detect those tiny signals that are coming from billion uh, light years away. So every astronomical receiver that detects spectral lines emitted by chemicals in galaxies and molecular clouds these days uses a hemp amplifier. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Perhaps then I could leap in with one of my own. I was very struck, uh, Dr. Mirimura, you used the word entranced when you described your reaction to Stockley's 48 paper. 
And I wonder if you could give some advice to, to young researchers. How do you know when you found the subject matter that will entrance you and motivate your future work? And how can you pursue it in the face of all the other pressures on you to take up other research uh, directions? Hi. Um, so. Well, I myself was not interested in creating something. But uh, I joined the company and I experienced creating something. And when I created something, for example, like Mr. Shockley uh, I talked about, so create a machine or transistor, so characteristics of the transistor was actually uh, coming to the actual item. And um, I was really uh, entranced and surprised the fact that uh, what I learned on the textbook can actually be made into this particular item. That is when I started uh, getting more interested in creating. At the beginning, I was working on the um, uh, working on the physics and uh, optical properties. That was my department to start with. But actually, I wasn't placed in that uh, original department, and I was moved, actually uh, placed in the um, device department. So I suppose that was by chance. At the beginning, actually, I didn't like it. But once I started creating a device, I found it really fun. So uh, I don't know how I can explain it, but even if it is not what you have wished for to start with, you can find a lot of fun in the things which comes to you. I think that's what I learned. Thank you very much. So for those of us who, those who were present earlier listening to um, Gray and Farquhar talk about the challenges of funding research and the pressures that exist for researchers, um, you, Dr. Mimura, have pursued a slightly different path insofar as your work has been based within um, that of an industrial research company in the case of Fujitsu. Um, you spoke or you alluded in your talk to a few occasions when perhaps you had pursued your interests, um, such as those with your colleagues on MBE, when maybe the company wasn't fully aware of what you were researching. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you were able to uh, pursue your interests and how you view the research agenda of a scientist working within a large industrial mm. corporation, perhaps, as compared to a researcher working in a university? Mm. Yes, in case of Hemd, I think it was an exceptional circumstance. The cost which was needed to uh, invent Hemd, we didn't use any uh, new source of money, shall I say, because we had a basic research was going on in the company by other people. and. Uh, we were able to make use of that, those past research, creating into a new technology. We were able to make use of that. For, exactly, for example, MBE system in 1970, it was about 100 million yen. Even if it's a big company, that is not the amount which is easily produced. But because there were so people who were in MBE uh, research, they were in a difficult position. So although we had 100 million yen spent on creating this system, but we couldn't get the result or out, good outcome out to start with, we couldn't show why we made it or what was good for. So when you, it's not necessarily just for the company doing the research, but when, you are, when we are doing various research, that happens. So making use of the technology, and if that can be made use as a device, this might be a very rare case. It's not often the case. But I think I was very lucky that we were able to make use of what we created into an actual device. 
I think uh, the luck can play a big role. It might be just a chance, but um, I think that's important too. Thank you very much. You mentioned in the early part of your career that uh, mm. senior researchers encourage more junior researchers to experiment and to fail. Um, Jason Barron, who's watching uh, our discussion today, has asked how a researcher working for a corporate company today can find a way to reconcile the focus on profit with the freedom to go where the research calls. So I guess two questions. First, do you think that the circumstances have changed since your experience where you were encouraged to experiment and fail? And uh, in light of that answer, what advice would you give to the younger researchers working in the corporate setting today? Yes, if you're working for a company, I think it, uh, budget is getting very severe, I understand. However, unless you challenge, because when you do a research, you cannot really see what happens, what, ha what, what you find. You don't know the outcome in the future, but we have to go ahead with the research. Unless you do, we don't see any advancement. So I think it's important to do research. So one thing I can say is that uh, I think this is a proverb in the UK, for, uh, fortune favors um, um, only the prepared mind, uh, the past tools uh, word. So, so, like the the, the, um, the the Japanese proverb also has a similar idea that the the God will favors people who prepares. So I'd like to encourage young researchers in that way. Thank you very much. There's a gentleman in the middle there with a with a question earlier. Would you like to come? Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. At the back, please. Could we have a microphone to to sort of? If you just introduce yourself, please, that would be great. Tetsuro Matsushima. Um, I'm a student here at the MPP. Um, uh, listening to your story, uh, you were placed in the uh, department which was not you wanted, and uh, you continued with the research, and that uh, you were able to develop a new technology. But recently, particularly in Japan, uh, the way we work has changed, and I think the researchers are experiencing the same thing. So what I'd like to ask you is that uh, looking at the job hunting, and often uh, people, if people are not placed in where they wanted to go, they just decide to go somewhere else. And if you don't get the outcome straight away, uh, they may give up. Or rather than working for one company, you want to go to a better paid job. So I think compared with the old Japan, I think people move a lot, and I think that has changed. So this kind of tendency, looking at the society as a whole, do you think um, sort of efficient allocation of the scientists and the researchers, um, do you think that is important? Or researchers themselves may not realize their own talent and the possibility. And if they moved, um, we may uh, stop that possibility. How do you feel about this? It's, if you feel happy or if you feel uh, if it's enjoyable or not, I think it's very important. If it's enjoyable, 
then you can continue. I think that's important. If you don't enjoy it, well, to be honest, I'm not a very patient person. So if I'm not enjoying it, I think I want to stop straight away. I think that's a natural way of thinking. Therefore, you are put in a, a position where one wasn't expecting. That's what happened to me. But uh, for three months, I I spent, and then I I could feel oh it's actually interesting. So that happened to me. So so that was the fact. So it's important. You have to find it interesting. Uh, what's interesting, what, what interests you is different. So I don't know how to answer your question. So each person is interested and uh, find fun in, in different things. So, but that's important. That's an important criteria for me, whether it's fun or interest to you or not. Dr. Mimura, I wanted to ask you about um, the twin uh, pressures in research work of collaboration on the one hand, and sorry, uh, and I wanted to ask you about the twin pressures of collaboration and competition. So, in an article of yours that I read, you talked about a stimulus in 1979 of a visit from Bell Laboratories, where you hid some of the work that you were currently undertaking because you knew it was commercially sensitive but the visitor revealed how close they were to your discoveries, mm. and you saw that as a real stimulus to your work. So there's an example of how the competitive instinct can be a real stimulus to progress in scientific research. But within your description of working in Fujitsu, you've talked about how you found partners across the company to work with in order to advance the discoveries that you were making. So perhaps you could explain to us or share with us a little bit of your reflection on the conditions that allow for collaboration and the, and the impetus of competition and how important that is. Hi. Hi. To uh, start a new project, smaller the team, the better, maybe two or three people at most, maximum three people. Otherwise, our people have different uh, opinions, so direction can't be decided easily. Therefore, uh, with people you can really agree with, there won't be too many. Three people, with him, uh, there are four people. But uh, usually two or three people will decide on the direction. When you start on brand new things, a f smaller the team, the better. And if you fail, you can uh, do it. If you are on your own, you can change the direction if it doesn't go very well. So that kind of uh, um, agility is important, I think. Basically, that is important in competition. You've got to do it very quickly. If you think like that, if you are on your own, you think this is the right way to reach that, you have to, well, target is one, but you might have to change the directions many times. Therefore, agility is important. In order to win, also, it's better to have a smaller team. I think that's better. Um, is, the, is the culture of basic research at Fujitsu is as intense as it used to be? Or ha In other words, had the story of hemp happened today, would you be able, given the chance, to invent the hemp, or would you be a, told you have to do things because of financial pressure, etc.? I'm saying that because one of the best papers I read about antennas and so on 20 years ago came okay, from Bell Laboratory, uh, where the cosmic microwave background is. But are these, have these things changed since? Uh, 
I think uh, we can still do it. And the Bell Laboratory, the new things that the groups will, there aren't many, only two or three people are doing uh, this. Nobel Prize, usually three people win. Perhaps it's a sort of a good size group. Three people, that's the max. And smaller than three, I think it's better for the basic research. I think it's more effective to have a smaller group. Therefore, a lot of researchers. It will be a different phase, not the um, basic research, but that, uh, the application level, maybe you need more input, more people. But at the very beginning, core idea, if you're working on the core idea, smaller number of people will lead to a better uh, result, outcome. Thank you. One question down here, and then I'll come to the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adil, and I'm from Canada. Uh, I wanted to begin first by responding to one of your comments, which was that you're just an ordinary engineer. And I don't think I've ever met any ordinary engineer, and I mean that in a complimentary way. <laughs> uh, but my question is: one of the enduring question, one of the enduring dilemmas in science and technology is how we deal with the ethics and morality of what we create. Uh, and certainly here at the Blavatnik School of Government, we like to, we're trying to think about how we can address the ethics and morality of uh, developing technologies. Hemp seems like an incredible example of a technology that has helped humanity, but could potentially uh, have some potentially sinister applications as well. And I was curious to, th to ask if you've ever thought about the ethics behind the things that you've discovered and whether you have any thoughts on how scientists can think about that moving forward and perhaps how they can interact with policymakers as well. Thank you. Right, that's a big question. Myself, well, ethics, what I was interested in that field, I don't I haven't really thought about ethics very much in my field. Perhaps in a different field of science, well, I, I can't really say, say much, but, but the, in some field, ethics is important. But uh, for example, hemp, there are lots of applications. I can't think of any application which will come into sort of an ethical pro problem at the moment. I can't really see any application. Thank you. I think there was a question at the back. Thank you. Can you just wait for the microphone, if you would. That would be great. Thanks. Hello, my name is Boon. Uh, I'm a postdoc from physics. So slightly more technical questions instead of policy making. So you mentioned in the begin uh, that you were really surprised that it's the low noise property of the hand that make it really popular and open up you know, many, many applications. Um, so the, the first question is that in the beginning, when you're starting hands, you you're obviously not focusing on the low noise property. So what is the, the original objective that you're trying to pursue? <laughs> and the second question is that, given that the low noise property is the key that makes it so popular, as uh, Professor Kazan said, that it, it is that property that you know, requires in many, many like, super sensitive um, application, how low noise can HAMS like, ultimately achieve? Thank you. Right. How much you can reduce the noise? Well, I don't know. I don't have an answer. And uh, 
When I was thinking about that hemp, the speed, high speed, the, the noise, I wasn't thinking about it. Of course, as the speed goes up, the, the noise uh, fear will go up. Yeah, so, so it will go down. Therefore, the noise. Because of the noise, uh, the, there'll be applications. I didn't know that fact. Uh, I was ignorant of that fact. So, when the hand uh, was made into the the, the uh, amplifier and the U.S. Uh, the um, radio uh, observatory people told me, and I was really very surprised uh, about this application. So in in the paper, I we did mention that that the, the noise was low, but I didn't. Uh, we didn't say that, that this is uh, the characteristics of hemp. Therefore. I myself, uh, uh, I heard this really out of the blue. The, the, there's a market because of the low noise property. That was a surprise. Perhaps I could then just finish with, with an open question to you both. Um, it's been fascinating for those of us who did not uh, know so much about hemp at the start of this to understand more its many applications and properties. And I've had the privilege to speak with you a little bit further, Professor Yassin, about your work. But I wonder if I could ask you both what you see as the next frontier for this area of research. So uh, to Dr. Mimura, uh, any further um, developments of hemp and improvements in its properties and how those will be applied. Oh, yeah. To Professor Yassin, a little bit perhaps about your work which okay. relates to hemp will be very interesting. Hemt uh, field, energy saving uh, will be a big thing. For example, AC adapters, if you can use a hemp in that kind of thing in, in future, well, you are carrying it, but the, it will go into the PC. It will be really tiny, AC-DC uh, uh, converter. That conversion uh, efficiency will go up and no loss of electricity. So not the low uh, noise, but the different properties will uh, be uh, coming into light. And then I think there'll be different kind of uh, applications will be that. Uh, gar gallium nitrite at the blue LED that the same uh, material could be used to make this. And the, and hemp uh, at Fujitsu, we have the already micro AC DC converter. We already have it. So speed switching is very sharp, very good cutting. So that's another good property. And you can do it very quickly. Therefore, energy saving will come because of that. I think that's one of the big directions for the future application of the hemp. I think it will be a new challenge. Yeah, um, hemp has got lots of applications. Um, my interest is um, using them in astronomical receivers. And the name of the game is sensitivity. Um, at the moment, they are really good. I mean, they give what we call five times the quantum limit. We would have liked it one time the quantum limit. Uh, we don't think they can achieve that, actually. As a matter of principle, unless very basic change in the design um, uh, is done. And there is one more issue. If you, have, if you push the frequency higher, then it's become more challenging. Then the sensitivity becomes even less. The uh, other thing, I, as uh, Dr. Memora mentioned, is the energy. We, if we want to use them in astronomy, we use them in cryostat. That is, we cool them to 4 Kelvin in order to make them um, better. And, and therefore, we need cooling power 
So if you use lots of them in a cryostat, you dissipate a lot of heat, and therefore taking them to space become an issue. And I have to confess, because of that, we are, um, in my group uh, with Boone there, we are developing an alternative to HEMT, which is based on superconducting devices, because superconducting devices don't dissipate energy, and hopefully uh, one day we'll get um, uh, an amplifier, which is the success of, uh, um, of HEMT amplifier. Thank you very much. So look, for somebody like me, who knew very little about this topic coming into the discussion, which may speak to some others as well, it's been absolutely riveting and fascinating. Um, Dr. Mimura, you spoke about competition and about the way in which science builds upon itself, the way in which you were inspired by papers written in the mid-1940s to find your passion uh, for this area of research. And in a way, it's very nice to finish with um, Professor Yassin talking about the way in which your discovery is inspiring further research here in Oxford and is integral to the research that's taking place. But on behalf of everybody here and uh, the others watching online, um, I'd like to thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your thoughts with us. It was not just inspiring in terms of knowledge, but also I think as, as uh, Adil referred to, your humility in describing yourself as an ordinary engineer when it's quite clear that your discovery has had such a huge impact on our world uh, is, is itself very inspiring. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. On behalf of everybody, I'd just like to uh, close this session with a further thanks uh, to our translators. This is a pretty technical topic, and I think you did a wonderful job in keeping up and keeping us all briefed as we went through that particular topic. Uh, and to the others who've been involved in the technical side of things, filming and doing the sound and so on for this uh, session this morning, thank you as well. Um, we now take a break. I hope very much that you will rejoin us at 5 to 3 this afternoon in good time for the start at 3 o'clock of uh, the presentation by our final laureate, Richard Taruskin. We'll be joined on stage by a piano and a uh, quartet. Uh, he will be performing Shostakovich's piano quintet, about which Dr. Taruskin will speak. And I look forward very much to seeing you then. Thank you.